David, I want to thank you for an absolutely incredible presentation. And I'm, I'm sorry that we have so little time. As Sandy said earlier, we have an absolutely packed schedule. And I'm going to ask our next panel panelists to come up and take your seats because we're going to roll right into it. Um, and I will tell you, as I told the others, that I am not going to give you the introduction that you deserve. Um, and so I will ask forgiveness later. OK. Um, can you cue it up? Okay, so I'm going to give you just a, a little brief introduction of our panelists and tell you that Mr. John Steele, the oral historian, uh, is not able to be with us. Um, it would not have been possible for him to, to make the presentation that he wanted to make in his free time. So we're going to give you an introductory video. And I want to just introduce our panelists right now. Uh, first, we have Judge Mary Scriven, who... Um, was appointed as a US, U.S. District Court judge to the Middle District of Florida in 2008. She served as a magistrate judge for some 10 years. She was a shareholder in the law firm of Carlton Fields and others, uh, where she was in the corporate litigation unit. She uh, formerly taught at NITA, uh, and she is uh, an amazing supporter and friend of the criminal justice section and an incredible judge, and we're delighted to have her here this morning. Um, next, we have Mr. Delano Stewart, uh, who was the first uh, African American to serve as a public defender here in uh, Tampa. He also uh, formed the first integrated uh, law firm uh, in, I believe, in, in the state of Florida. Um, he was. He was elected, uh, the first African-American elected to the Hillsborough County Bar Association. Uh, and he was the founder of the African-American Bar Association here, the George Etcom Bar Association. Finally, we have Judge Tracy Todd, a state court judge in Alabama. Uh, she received an undergraduate degree from Dillard University. She did ex an exchange program in Australia. She lived for a time in Japan, and she speaks fluent Japanese. Um, she is a judge in the Central District uh, of um, uh, Alabama in Jefferson County. Uh, she got her law degree from the University of Alabama, and in 2018, in May, on the 13th of May, she's going to get receive an LLM uh, from Duke University in North Carolina. Um, there are our panel this morning. Mr. Stewart was going to go over some history because he lives in Philadelphia, Mississippi, where the, um, uh, the three civil rights workers, Goodman, Cheney, and Schwerner, were actually killed. And he, had, he was going to reminisce about that. He currently runs some tours of museums. So we wanted to show you just a little video uh, that basically puts this period, much as David did, in history without discussing the cases, but to talk about life on the ground. It's nine minutes. Uh, we may stop it before it ends, just because we're short on time. But I'm going to ask my capable assistant here who knows what he's doing <laughs> to, roll, to roll the tape, okay? Of course you do. <laughs> this panel is called Dark Hours, Difficult Days, and Daunting Challenges. And part of that was from Dr. King's um, mountaintop speech, or I Have a Dream speech that he
One day, this nation will rise up, live out the true meaning of its creed. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created. We believe that all men are created equal, yet many are denied equal treatment. We believe that all men have certain unalienable rights, yet many Americans do not enjoy those rights. We believe that all men are entitled to the blessings of liberty, yet millions are being deprived of those blessings not because of their own failures, but because of the color of their skin. The reasons are deeply embedded in history and tradition and the nature of man. We can understand without rancor or hatred how this all happened, but it cannot continue. Our Constitution, the foundation of our Republic, Forbids it. The principles of our freedom, forbid it. Morality, forbids it. And the law I will sign tonight, forbids it. Stop this now, if at least I would if I knew how. What would you come up with? <laughs> Thank you. You know, law clerks are wonderful because they take care of all this. Thank you so very much. Um, if anybody wants the rest of that slideshow, I'm, I'm happy to accommodate. So I, I think David talked about the law, um, and he took us through some of the cases. And the video and what Mr. Steele would have taken you through is life on the ground and, and, and what was going on even as we still held and embraced the ideals of what it means to be a citizen. And it tells you, in essence, that laws are not self-executing. You can have a wonderfully written law and you can still have what we saw here. It's interesting that, as David mentioned, 14th Amendment was ratified in 1868. And those events that we saw there were in the 50s and 60s. 150, pardon me, 100 years later was when uh, Dr. King was assassinated, 100 years after the ratification of the 14th. And we have to look at the progress that has been made 
in the 50 years since. And so I want to start this morning uh, just talking about uh, the progress that's been made. Mr. Stewart, let me ask you, it has been 150 years since the passage of the 14th Amendment, 50 years since the assassination of Dr. King. In terms of our progress, in terms of moving toward the, the goal of equality, inclusion, if you had to give a grade, what grade would you give us as a country in terms of, of that progress? I'd probably give us a C minus. Why? Because uh, freedom is very illusionary. Uh, I have this morning seen young people who I have known all of my life. And the real difficulty is that people adopt and will not think of what really is occurring because, and it does not have to do anything with whiteness because one of the most vicious battles that I was involved in, I nominated a black woman to be president of the black uh, lawyers of this state. And I had to almost fight because of the fact that all of these guys were actively engaged in the civil rights movement, but they were blind as the seeing segregating against a woman. So I, I, I live in a town, Tampa, that is Hispanic, black, Latin, but it's um, interesting how people claim and have false ideals of who they are because of how they were born. The Spanish were superior to the Italians, the Italians were so it's an illusion of what man does. And, and I am, I've been going to the same church 82 years. And I sometimes can be very cynical. We talk about David being 40 generations removed from Jesus, who we love and who died. Easter was a Sunday or so ago. And then uh, I was trying to make my Sunday school class think about how we thought about that. Potamus wife. Okay, Mr. Mr. Yeah. Stewart, let me, let me interrupt you just a second because you teed up something that I think is really important because what you said is that even within races and ethnic groups, there's still the issue mm -hmm. of bias and gender bias. So I want to ask Judge Scriven a woman who served as a judge for a number of years. Um, what would you give, and, and taking into account Mr. Uh, Stewart's comment about, um, I guess, in, intraracial and bias, interracial bias, um, what kind of grade would you give in terms of how much we have accomplished or whatever over this 50-year period as it relates to uh, women and minorities. What kind of grade would you give and tell us why? I'm a, I'm a tough grader. Okay. So, <laughs> and it kind of depends on the day and most recently depends on the year. Um, <laughs> but I think I would put us around a D plus uh, in some aspects a B. I think women have made some substantial strides okay. over the years uh, and, and would appear to be on the verge of a, of a pink wave, uh, as it were. And um, I think that's largely because um, given the opportunity, uh, people are just seeing the power of, of the female voice. And um, I don't want to be gender biased, but I think women tend to be more collaborative in their approach to resolution of problems and issues, and I think that's helped to sort of hold us together. But I was going to talk about my experience, because I was listening to these um, 
songs, and I'm a Baptist preacher's daughter, and you would think that my theme song might be the Battle Hymn of the Republic or <laughs> We Shall Overcome or something like that, but my theme song, for those who kind of grew up when I did, and I'm 55, I was five years old when Dr. King was assassinated, but my theme song is Raindrops Keep Falling on My Head. <laughs> and so I need a choir. Can anybody sing that for me? <laughs> Raindrops keep falling on my head. But that doesn't mean my eyes will soon be turning red. Crying is not for me, cause. And so the reason that that is my theme song, you'll, you'll remember it whenever you see me. The reason that's my theme song is when I was riding to school that my segregated, except for me and my brother, elementary school in second and third grade. For some reason, every time we got in a car to make that 15 minute drive, that was a song that was on the radio. Mm -hmm. And it was terrifying for me because I was going to go to a school where no one was allowed to speak with, to me other than my teachers. And I would go out on the playground and I would stand on the monkey bars and I would look out over the crowd and pretend they were my students or they were my friends. And I had some friends who would give me the side eye and say, you know, you're cool with us, but they weren't allowed to speak to me. And that can form the basis of your view about race and equality. Even though you're in the same place, you're not the same. And so have we come far from there? Yes, that's the B side of us. Do we have still a long way to go? I think that would be the D plus side of us. Judge Todd, you're a state court judge. You are a prosecutor. Uh, and you obviously, all of, all of this is well before <laughs> you were born. <laughs> you are a young person on the panel, standing on the shoulders of those who uh, were in those marches, those who were at the other ends of, of water hoses and snarling dogs. What grade would you give in terms of how much um, we have uh, achieved since, um, just let's say since Dr. King's death? Well, I would say this. And pull the I, mic closer because somebody I'm in the sorry. back is as, at least as old as I am. Okay. Can't hear. Um, I am a direct descendant and b beneficiary of all of the video slides. In fact, um, my great grandfather had all of his equal protection rights uh, violated when he decided to allow the marchers during the Civil Rights uh, Voting Rights March from Selma to Montgomery. He allowed the marchers to stay on his property, including Dr. King. And as, as a result of him doing that, um, because of course you can imagine Highway 80 at night with black marchers was extremely dangerous. And so they had, to, they had to bed down somewhere. And at that time there were not a lot of black landowners in, in the area and so he was one of the few. And so they, they bedded down there and as a result of him allowing Dr. King and the folks to bed down, his bank account was frozen, um, he was threatened, the U.S. Marshal had to come in and surround his property while Dr. King and the marchers were there. And he died before he even got the right to vote, which is ironic that he <laughs> sacrificed his life literally so that people could vote. But as a result, his great granddaughter sits on a state bench. And so as the direct beneficiary of that sacrifice, we have made extreme um, progress in that regard. So I would say a B plus um, <laughs> from that, but as a sitting state judge, um, seeing what I see, having disposed of almost 3,000 cases since I've been on the bench, we have a long way to go in terms of mass incarceration and sentencing disparities. Um, and so for that, I give probably an F plus because we have some <laughs> ways to go there. <laughs> yeah. Mr. Stewart, you were um, a, a public defender. You also started your own uh, and the first integrated law firm. You actually lived some of these things that we saw in the, um, uh, in the picture. So tell me about the motivation and inspiration uh, for you to start that firm and how you were able to overcome some of the things you experienced personally and still uh, not have bitterness and, and start, a, um, and start a, an integrated law firm. Who says Dell doesn't have bitterness? <laughs> <laughs> I think that I have tried to exercise my bitterness in a uh, positive way, uh, the reason that I integrated my practice, because I think example is better than precept, and the person that I got with me was a Vanderbilt law student and a Brown undergraduate. 
I wanted to have somebody who had all the credentials, and I wanted to show that I could employ him and make him respect me uh, because of my intellect. And uh, it was very interesting in two ways. There would be black people who I would come and I would give them a uh, solution to their problem and they ignored them. I'd call Marty in, he'd tell them the same thing, and they'd say, yes, sir, Mr. Lawyer. <laughs> so it, it, it is so deeply embedded in people, superiority and inferiority. And I think my greatest help, my daddy lost an arm when he was 12 years of age. And he, his daddy came to him and said, because he had lost consciousness, your left arm has been amputated and you aren't going to get it back. You got two alternatives. You can embroil yourself in self-pity or get off your A and use what you got left. So my basic underlying thing is whatever happens, then I must overcome it. That is my obligation and duty to life. And uh, I, <coughs> I could be bitter, but I, I, sometimes uh, my sense of humor makes me overcome the stupidity <laughs> of racism because it's absolutely stupid. My, my best friend who was uh, over the uh, first black, he was a surgeon. I had represented him when he was in school. And this guy came in, and he had both arms broken, legs, massive injuries. And when he gave him a shot of adrenaline, the guy looked up and said, now can you save my life? So he saw salvation in him, but his overriding uh, bias uh, came out even in the condition that he was in. So I think my daddy's birth and the way he raised me, because my daddy could do everything but button the sleeve on his right arm. He learned to tie bow ties, and, he not, and I never heard him cry. So consequently, because of that, I became a positive out of uh, <laughs> situations that you should have been angry about. And I want to, this last point, I am in the service. I get out of my first tech class, and I got 100 on my test. And the white guy says, whose paper is that? I say, it's my paper. And what's interesting, we were on bivouac, and it was raining like the devil, and he had his last cigarette, was wet, and I was smoking, and he took a drag on that cigarette. He said, Lord, if my granddaddy and daddy would see me, they would disinherit me. And it is conditioning of ignorance that makes people hate. If I walked up to the young lady and she started speaking Japanese, <laughs> I would be confused because I had predisposed what she could do or not do. And that's the problem with, with this country and with people. Yeah, go ahead. And, and that's an interesting point because, and as Judge talked about being a woman and what Mr. Stewart just said, in my own experience um, as an interpreter, before I went to law school, I did some interpreting for a Japanese uh, automotive supplier in Alabama. Yes, in Alabama. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and uh, I would walk into the room, and, and on one side of the room would be the executives from from Japan, the Japanese executives for our company. And on the other side, you have these heads from Honda, Nissan, Toyota, usually white male. I was usually the only woman in the room and the only person of color other than my Japanese colleagues. And when I would walk in the room, it, there was always an assumption that I was the secretary or I was there to get coffee. Mm -hmm. And so I used my sense of humor, Mr. Stewart, to help <laughs> me through it because I knew who I was. And so yeah. I would oblige and go get coffee and go get pens and go get everything. <laughs> Yeah. And it was so funny every time that these um, executives came in, they couldn't understand why the meeting hadn't started. <laughs> well, the meeting hadn't started because you are having me go get coffee, and the meeting can't start without me. <laughs> and so um, it was always just this, this yeah. funny thing for me, this sense of 
that, you know, that's why you shouldn't make assumptions about people because they just naturally assumed because I was a woman, a person of color, mm -hmm. that I was the secretary. But those four white guys that I worked with initially, we started the company from the ground up um, here. They couldn't do anything without me, and so it was it was a fun time to work with them, and for us to break down those barriers in Alabama was an interesting time. I had a, a similar experience. Um, one of your colleagues, who will remain nameless, I found that when you have your robe on, you are Judge Scriven, and when you don't have your robe on, you're some lady who's supposed to do something for you and serve you in some way. <laughs> And uh, one of your colleagues was in my court. We had had the hearing. I had my robe on. I'm kind of conspicuous in the federal court. And I <laughs> go you back think? to Chambers. He's coming back to get his bond paperwork signed for his client. I come back to Chambers. I take off my robe. And I'm walking over to get a cup of coffee out of my coffee galley. And he says, you must be Susan. Where is my bond paperwork? And I joke it to him with him about it all the time. He still is embarrassed. <laughs> but I said, no, this is Judge Scriven. Do I need to go put my robe on and come back out here for yeah. you to see? So it's in the context of your self, you are a different person than in the context of your robed self. And I found that I, mean, I have stood as close as I am to uh, Judge Todd with Carlton Fields colleagues at a car wash and they didn't recognize me because they know they only know one black person and it couldn't possibly be the only one black person they know <laughs> is standing next to them at the car wash and so their peripheral vision sort of edits out that person because they don't expect to see anybody they know in their everyday walk. <laughs> okay, well that, that is quite interesting. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and I can't say that I haven't had those experiences. Uh, you know, we always want to help people achieve the next level. And I'm going back to this grading thing now, because if you're a teacher and you've got a student that's underperforming, you want to be able to tell that student how they can get from a C to a B and from there. So we know in the movement, we, we all know those luminaries, you know, Frank Johnson, J. Skelly Wright, all, all those people who, who because, yep. because the federal court was the place that African Americans then went for relief. I mean, they were, uh, at that time, uh, the place where people believed, and, and oftentimes, notwithstanding um, David reminding us that the, the, the um, Supreme Court had some dark times. I mean, we all remember the case where Justice Roger Taney, and this was way back in the Dred Scott case, said that a black man has no rights yep. that a white man is bound to respect. Yep. Uh, and, and that's still flowing, and I think you heard uh, Mr. Stewart talking about some of that, you know, today and finding coping me mechanisms, but I want to go to Mr. Stewart and ask you, how can you, what, what's the prescription for us as a country getting from a C minus to a B plus in your mind and then on to, it's going to take a lot to get to the A, but how do we get from that C plus? What needs to happen now at this point in our journey? We uh, must seek to understand and not prejudge people. I, I, I find it interesting this morning, I, uh, Cody Fowler had two grandsons who were my age, and Benjamin Mays, who was the president of Morehouse, was here at the Urban League in 1920. We just put a statue out on our river walk. He was Mr. Mays, his wife was Mrs. Mays, and he insisted that he be respected. You cannot make people respect you, but you must insist that they do. And what is intriguing to me, there's a book that has a beautiful surprise, Devil in the Grove, that talks about Willis McCall, who was a ruthless individual. And Thurgood came down to defend these young men who had been falsely accused, and he got a verdict from the Supreme Court. They overturned it. Willis McCall went to get them out of jail personally and shot them all 
accusing them of attempting to escape, and they were manacled and handcuffed. Now, Thurgood was in my house to represent my mother's friend. My mother was a teacher and my father. And the man who he brutally blew up was attempting to file a suit for equalization of teacher's salaries. And he, Thurgood, was going to represent Miss Hilda Turner and this man who was blown to, he and his wife were killed on Christmas Eve. And I guess what gets me is how people who are white and of good will will not denounce that kind of conduct. And I think that that is until white people make a collected effort. Nobody calls our president a damn fool. He could be white and he can be rich but he is ignorant and he vitiates everything that the Constitution stands for. And until we fight that fight, we won't cure the problem. Okay. Judge Scriven, what do we need to do as a country to get from a C minus in some instances and a B plus in others to get to the next grade level in both of those areas? And I think. Mr. Stewart has made some, some really incredible points. And after I go to Judge Todd and you, I'm going to go back and talk about another thing that basically ties on, Mr. Stewart, to what you were just talking about. Judge Scriven, how are we going to improve the grade? Um, I think it's going to be our children who make the difference. Um, we have to have relationships with people. We can't just be disembodied black people and white people and male people and female people, we have to have relationships with people in order for us to care enough to want to make a difference. And um, I encourage you, as I do whenever I talk about this business of, um, of um, diversity, to look in your own lives. Did your daughter get married? Did your son get married? what did the wedding crowd look like? Did you have any natural friends who didn't work for you as a babysitter or who didn't work for you in your yard come to your child's wedding? Do you have any people who would come to your funeral other than people who look like you? Because building relationships is what makes a difference in how people view one another just inherently. And so I think relationships, I was, my husband just um, started his own practice again, and he was going through some papers um, to throw stuff away, and he ran across some old Jeeva minutes. This is the George Edgecombe Bar Association. And, you know, you think you get somewhere by yourself. These are the 1985 minutes of the George Edgecombe Bar Association. And the president was Ken Glover, who is a character, <laughs> and there was a detailed discussion of the open U.S. magistrate position and on the lack of opportunity for blacks to obtain this kind of positions. I'll read the typos along with the rest of the minutes. A volunteer committee consisting of Ken Glover, Warren Dawson, and Fred Buckine will pursue efforts to get blacks on the selection committee. The membership adopted a resolution to authorize the special committee to pursue by appropriate means, including sending written communications to get blacks on the selection committee and to increase the chances of getting blacks selected to these positions. And that was in 1985. So it, and I became the first black magistrate judge in the Middle District of Florida in 1997. <laughs> and so it takes some chiseling, and, well second, because of Chuck Wilson, it takes some chiseling some hacking and some persistence over time for these changes to occur in the way that our society is developed. And so um, I think you have to remember that other people push forward for you, and then you have to pay it forward to other people. Well said. <laughs> Judge Todd, how are we going to increase and get the country to the next, so that it earns the next grade level? Well. Uh, in my estimation, as, as I said, as a sitting judge, I feel like one of the key areas, as I stated earlier, as it relates to equal protection and as well as the 13th Amendment, 
uh, has to do with our mass incarceration and sentencing disparities in this country. That is the civil rights movement, in my mind, of our time. Um, we have every state in this union incarcerates people at higher rates than countries that we have deemed to be human rights violators. Uh, the state of Alabama is the fifth highest incarcerator in the world, where we incarcerate about 990 people per 100,000 in, in, in our state. And the lowest state, or one of the lowest states, is Massachusetts, that that's, does about 660 per 100,000. And so we have an issue there. People are being incarcerated at inhumane rates every day in the criminal justice system. And what is causing that? What is pushing that? So some of the things that I think we can move forward on this is that, one, we have to deal with mandatory min minimum sentencing. That is causing a lot of this. The war on drugs in the 1980s pushed a lot of this, where you have low-level, nonviolent drug offenses getting these huge amounts of time. And there's still, it's just this trickle down. I mean, the, the incarceration rates went from up 300 percent after the war on drugs because of mandatory minimum sentencing. The second thing is we have to address state judges being elected on, in partisan elections. That's driving a lot of this as well. Judges have to be tough on crime and their political ads look like any other position. That is ludicrous. And I, here I am a sitting judge who has to run in a partisan election and I find it absolutely incredible. I just did an interview on a research project with about 33 judges in Alabama and Massachusetts, and my colleagues in Alabama acknowledge that they sentence based on elections. That is incredible. And if you think about that, that is something that we should all be concerned about. Uh, empirical studies have shown that more people get death sentences during election time in states with a death penalty, especially Alabama. And so until we deal with these issues now, those are the pressing in my mind, uh, we will not get anywhere. But if we do those things and address those issues, we will make huge strides in this new um, fight that we have in terms of criminal justice reform and the, and the needs there. Thank you, Judge. I have to uh, interject at this point, even though I'm not on the panel, but <laughs> the point that she just made about uh, sentencing during election years. Um, Professor Sarah Redfield and I have been working on the Enhancing Justice Reducing Bias Project. And one of the things that we have learned in the research is these, many of these sentencing disparities devolve down to race. People with more Afrocentric features get sentenced more harshly than people who are lighter complected. Tracy, um, not Tracy George, she's Vanderbilt, but Tracy Birch at Northwestern in Chicago has done a study on a population out of the Georgia State Prison. These are people who had similar crimes, similar criminal history, and they're all within the African American population, the sample set that she looked at. And what she found was that darker complected African Americans were sentenced much more harshly by judges than their lighter complected counterparts. Mm -hmm. If you go along the color continuum, the length of the sentence sort of corresponds to skin color. So people who are light caramel colored far, fare better than the dark mocha. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's, it's, it, that is an indictment on us as a country, an indictment on our profession, and certainly an indictment on the criminal justice system, but prison officials, police officers don't sentence, judges do. I'm gonna get ready to, because I know we, we, we don't have much time, and Sandy, we're gonna go five minutes over and then we're gonna stop. Yeah. Okay, or 10, <laughs> great, okay. So I wanna share with you, and then I'm gonna, I'm gonna give you an opportunity to ask our panel a couple of questions, then I'm gonna save them one minute to close. But, but let me tell you, since we, we're in the um, commemorative period of Dr. King's assassination, Two things that, uh, that I observed back in Memphis. Um, you know that on April 3rd of 1968, um, the city of Memphis filed an injunction to stop the march to prevent Dr. King from conducting the march in Memphis. And I had the uh, opportunity to witness uh, a panel with the lawyers from the LDF and the ACLU who took on the representation of Dr. King and the, the ministers from out of town who were gonna lead the march. And one of the lawyers who, who was in the city attorney's office who actually had to present 
the injunction. And we know that uh, the judge who heard the temporary, I mean, the, the restraining order, actually did uh, enter an order allowing the march to go forward. He actually entered the written order the day following, and by the time that order was actually entered, Dr. King had already been killed. And so it's really chilling to look at the order where the judge says on, on last evening, uh, you know, Dr. King was, uh, was actually um, shot to death, and he actually put that in the order. But one of the things that the lawyer for the city said in the hearing, he said the paper wrote about the working conditions of the sanitation workers. He said, but I didn't know anything about those conditions. It spoke to the invisibility, the invisibility of these people who were doing the most demeaning work. They were taking out folks' garbage. And people weren't putting garbage in bags. Some of the sanitation workers, and there was one in the audience, they actually had to uh, lift these tubs on their shoulders. And garbage, garbage was sometimes streaming down <laughs> on their body, their clothing. They talked about those, th those containers being sometimes infested with maggots, that they were so smelly and soiled that when they went home, they could not even be near their families until they actually had to sort of clean up. And they were fighting for not a living wage. They were making somewhere between a dollar and a dollar fifteen an hour. And they wanted, I believe it was a 15 cent raise. They wanted to be able to, like their white counterparts, be paid when they could not work uh, because of weather. Because if they were African Americans, they couldn't work. They didn't get paid. The whites were allowed to, uh, to actually receive pay when they couldn't go in, but the African Americans could not. And this all was triggered by an incident on February 1 when two of the African American sanitation workers who had to ride on the rickety trucks, and I hope you've seen them, Elko uh, El El Cole and Robert Walker were actually trying to seek shelter from the rain. They were sitting on the back end of the truck for shelter, and through some kind of default, uh, they actually were swallowed up and ground up with the garbage on the right. back of the truck. And at that point, people decided, you know, we have got to seek some protections and some changes. And so uh, uh, one of the sanitation workers by the name of T.O. Jones started this whole thing. But, but for, the, for the attorney to say, who lived in Memphis, whose garbage these folks picked up, he said, I had no idea about their working conditions. And I think all of you have spoken to sort of that invisibility. Uh, that's one thing. And we also had, uh, during this whole ceremony, uh, the, the unveiling of a, a, a slave marker. Because Memphis was the site of one of the largest slave auctions uh, in the country. And we talk about slavery as sort of this concept, but there's no individuation. And in implicit bias talking, we have to talk about individuation. So one of the universities has been unearthing the sales record of some of these slaves, and they unveiled the marker. And as I, they actually called the names of each of these people sold into slavery that they've been able to locate so far. The youngest that they were able to identify and call the name of was three months old. There were two six-month-olds who were in that reading. The oldest was 50 that I was able to hear. But when we went out to get the marker unveiled, the marker was right across the street from the courthouse. <laughs> right across the street from the courthouse. And I took a picture, which I'm going to convert into a slide, but I didn't get a chance to do this now. So justice is not automatic. Not automatic. No matter how eloquent it appears on paper, it's not automatic. It has to be, first of all, embraced, embedded, and actualized. Uh, and all of us have to be responsible. We are the guardians, the stakeholders, and we have to make sure that it becomes a reality. So having said that now, and, uh, and recognizing that I'm on the panel, I'm going <laughs> to give you all a close, but if you want to react, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give, since Sandy's given us 10 minutes, and I have used some of those, I'm going to find out if there's a question for the panel from any of you in the audience, and if you shout it out, they will respond. Any, any questions of our panel, and then I'm going to give them uh, a little bit to close, time to close. 
Thank you. I do have a question. A comment? I wanted to commend uh, Stuart for mentioning Beverly Road. I'm a Raymond by birth. I went to high school on the last segregation of Dubner, 3,000 students, one black student. I remember as a child, my mother driving me to West Palm Beach with signs, no blacks, dogs, and Jews. <laughs> They're very I was strong. In Orlando. I have a friend who was, his father was a close friend of the sheriff. One day I asked my friend, who was a lawyer, about a, a book. And he knew exactly which book I was talking about. And he said, the only thing in that book that wasn't true was that the whole county knew what that sheriff did. I was an assistant U.S. attorney in Orlando starting in 73. This was just after. got a long way to go, but when you read that book, you will find that a lot of the problems that were encountered and the solutions were by the lawyers, and that's, that book was an inspiration for me. Thank you. And it reminds us, too, that uh, all of these atrocities didn't just occur in Mississippi and Alabama. Yes, madam. You see, um, what was the last part? What do you do about law enforcement funding? It, it's really difficult to address that. And, and this, this is, and, and when I talk about mass incarceration in this context, I think that there's a documentary that, that she did as well with Brian Stevens called 13th. And it talks about how the 13th Amendment basically has created, <laughs> yes, <laughs> has created a new slavery. And so that's why I talk about this in the context of equal protection. But yes, law enforcement funding, law enforcement bias, as, as Judge Donald is an expert on, prosecutorial discretion, all of it is tied together into this package that's very difficult to unpeel and unwrap. But we as judges, we as practitioners, we have to be vigilant in, in, in challenging what is going on. And I think that the lawyers have a much larger voice than we as judges have. Because we can't, it's only so much that we can say and do. We can do it with our pen. But in terms of challenging the funding and how these, how prosecutors are making de um, decisions um, has to come from the advocates in conjunction with the bench. And so that, that's a great question. It's a very difficult circumstance. And I noticed how many uh, prosecutors were at the reception last night at the judge's house and how few are here mm. this morning other than <laughs> Mr. <Pan>. <laughs> 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 One prosecutor said he's in the house. I yes, sir. Mary's here. Yes. Okay, if you could stand up, please, so we can hear you. Anyone? I, I, I suppose that's for me, maybe. I don't okay, know. I'll cool. take it. I okay. think that's a whole nother panel. Yeah. It is. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It, it is. But, but criminal justice reform in a conservative state like Alabama is a very difficult thing um, because of the, the electorate's values and what the politicians perceive to be the electorate's values. And when you have a tough on crime mandate, 
criminal justice reform is a difficult discussion to have, but as Judge Scrivener said, that's a that's a, another panel that could take a whole okay. another section of time. So. Right. But if the Koch brothers are really committed to uh, criminal justice reform, I think they can provide significant value mm -hmm. because they are, as you said, uh, a, a group that is not traditionally aligned with mm -hmm. these progressive values. And I think you need to recognize, people need to recognize that that this ought to be um, a, an issue for everybody. And I think part of part of this ha has to be looked at um, or, or be addressed sometimes in economic terms. And I don't mean the kind of profit profitability model that we're seeing with private prisons and all that, but I think people have to understand that um, and have to be educated around the really insidious effects of this over-criminalization uh, on, on families and really the fabric of this country. Yes, Mr. Stewart. Yeah, uh, uh, Mr. Tarantet, uh I, I believe that there has been a move afoot to remove and to take all criminal justice in the appellate arena away from the people. And that is because if you do that, Money and power will control what the law is as it has always been. And the less participation you have of the people, then the more conservative appellate courts become and have been becoming. And the other thing, I, I, I want to say this. Uh, when you asked, <laughs> Mary said that I sort of inferred that I am better. No, I am not bitter. I am a man that gave three years, seven months, and 21 days to die for this country. And I was willing to die anywhere and in courts in Tavares. I had a young lady who had come to visit her mother. Uh, we talk about the niceties. Happened to be Alabama. A woman in Alabama said, call me by my whole name, not by, and what, until we insist as a people that we will be treated, I have two cousins that died in World War II. All of my friends have, have served the country. We are owed the decency of respect because there is no debt that black people have not paid. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Stewart, for that. And, I, and it was spoken very powerfully, and it was spoken very truthfully. And I, I have to tell you that one of the things uh, that um, we talked a little bit about our common friend, H.T. Locker, if you look at the older African-American lawyers in Memphis, many of them went by initials. And part of that was because as lawyers in the courts, they were not given the basic respect right. of being given a, a courtesy title. They were not addressed as Mr. They would be in court with their clients and the judge would either call them um, Ed or Sam or, mm -hmm. and they would refer to the person's client as, you know, put your nigger client on the sand. And so people, lawyers tried every way they could to try to get whatever measure of respect. And so most of the older lawyers uh, you know, H.T. Lockhart, <laughs> B.L. Hooks, because they thought at least if you are not going to give me the respect of a courtesy title, you're not going to call me by my first name, so you're going to give you these initials. And so that's what they did. A.A. A. Ladding, you know, H.T. Lockhart, B.L. Hooks, uh, and, and with, uh, Ben F. Jones, they would not put their names on the pleadings so that the judge could not address them by their first name. And one of the, one of the horrible things for me was to watch my father who worked every day of his life, but who was addressed by children mm -hmm. as Perry. But for an eight-year-old white child, he had to address that person as Miss Judy or Miss Linda. He could not address them by their first name. That was the, the case in which we live. So I, I appreciate you bringing that up. And we I know we're out of time now, so I'm going to give Judge Scriven 
a minute to close. Judge Todd, a minute to close, and then we're all going to give you our thanks, and we're going to ask you to thank them. Judge Scriven, what do you want to leave us with? I want to leave you two things. First, when my, my father-in-law was the first black police chief in Jacksonville, um, but he could only arrest black people. <laughs> and if he saw white people commit a crime, he had to wait until the white police showed up to actualize the arrest. Um, and it, you know, it creates a sense of who you are and your space. And this was in the 70s. This wasn't in 1800s <laughs> and the na 1960s. <laughs> um, but then all is not lost because when I got ready to go to Duke University, I went to my guidance counselor at Southwest High School and told her about my aspirations, primarily because I saw this really cute guy at the Duke uh, College <laughs> orientation. <laughs> But I wanted to go there, and I told her I wanted to go there, and she said, Mary, you'll never get into that school, and if you do, it'll be because you're black, and if you get in because you're black, you'll fail. And so I think it's a waste of your time. <laughs> I went to, if you can call a silk stocking firm, a silk stocking firm in Macon, Georgia, a guy named Thomas Bass, a white guy, and he wrote me this glowing recommendation and I got into Duke, I graduated, my daughter got into Duke with a full ride and she graduated. So I think one person can make a difference that changes an entire generation or two. So look at what you can do instead of looking at what other people can do uh, to change the course of a black girl's history uh, in Macon, Georgia. Well, I will just say that I'm honored to even be <laughs> sitting next to these folks because I do stand on their shoulders and, and Judge Donald. <laughs> I've told you about my great-grandfather. My uncle was the first black police officer in Birmingham. And when he was on his I first day uh, on the job, he had to take the bus to his first stop because his partner would not l let him ride in the patrol car with him. And so he went out to the street looking for his partner who left him to crowds and throngs of black folks who were just happy to see the first black police officer. <laughs> and he had to get on the bus in front of them to go to his first stop. And so living and coming up under people like my uncle and living through the legacy of my great grandfather, and my grandmother, and all of my family who have done amazing things, I understand that I stand on the shoulders of folks like this and that I have a responsibility to pay it forward to make sure that those who come behind me have opportunities that I have or more. But I will say this in, in leaving that, that the young folks in this room, and I consider young ages and attitudes, so if you feel like you're young, <laughs> you're young. Um, that's what my 80-year-old grandmother says, ages and attitude. But I say that, that the younger people in this room have a responsibility to take initiative to seek out mentorship and to do our part in furthering the legacy. And that doesn't matter what color. That has no color bearing because we're all in this together at the end of the day. But I also say to the older generation that I know that, that your work has been done, it's been tedious, but we have to develop a pipeline to, to address these issues. You can tell us your stories, but if you don't show us how to do it, it's difficult to pick up the mantle and run with it without making unnecessary forced, uh, unforced errors, as they say. And so I say, young folks, we have responsibility to, to move forward. Older generation, teach us how to do it so that we can do it and don't shut off or pull up the ladder behind you. Wonderful, and I'm gonna... <laughs> And as Lawrence O'Donnell says, I'm going to give the last word to Delano Stewart. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Judge Donald. Uh, I will not become bitter because I know that man is imperfect, and I use that non-generically. And my belief, when I tried a case in Tavares, where Willis McCall was, the NAACP sent me to represent a lady who is in jail without bond who came to see her mother and she was parking and the lady who owned the four row houses said B-I-T-C-H move the car. She said who are you talking to? She is in jail without bond. I, I had to get the NAACP and ended up getting a $10,000 bond on a traffic ticket. So when I went to court, they continued the case because, and finally they let me try the case in the brand new uh, county commissioner's chambers. 
So when I attempted to cross-examine this woman, she would not say a word. I said, Your Honor, I'm an officer of your court. I pull out my bar license and my driver's license. This is for the record. I am so, and then when I do that, the bailiff pulls his pistol up and down in his holster. And I say, Your Honor, let, him, let me make it unequivocally clear. I did three years, seven months, 21 days for freedom in this country. I made 98 in constitutional law at Howard, and if this is my death day, so shall it be. Answer my question. He declared a mistrial. I never went back. But you have to stand up and die for what you believe, or you will never change it. 